Hello and welcome to the Unit 3 podcast on Section 8.3, Names and Formulas for Ionic Compounds. I'm Mr. Sakaguchi. And I'm Mr. Lin. And let's start. So let's first talk a little bit about formulas for ionic compounds. Um, the smallest unit for um, an ionic compound is known as the formula unit. It's the simplest ratio of ions represented in a compound. So for instance, MgCl2 represents the lowest whole number ratio in which these ions interact to form ionic bonds. Um, if you look at the figure here on the right, this is NaCl. If the green blobs or spheres are chloride ions and the purple spheres are sodium, we know that the formula is notice how they interact together in a one-to-one -one ratio in terms of how, notice how their ions add up to zero. And this would represent the formula unit. All right, so um, just remember from the previous uh, PowerPoint, that whatever electrons are lost by one compound are sorry by one element are gained by another one and that when you total it all up it equals zero at all times yeah so the overall charge for ionic compounds always has to add up to zero so if you can't put ions together and it add up to zero then you don't have the formula unit the charges of the positive and negative ions are necessary to determine the formula and we'll talk more about why in a minute um, in your book, they're called oxidation states, but charge of ions is, is the same Essentially what it is, yeah. So, just same thing, just stated a different way. So, how do you determine the charge? Well, fortunately for us, a lot of that information is already on the periodic table. So, for the representative elements, remember representative elements have A's at the top of the groups. Usually for the metals, the number of the of the group tells you what the charge will be. So one, all notice how all 1A elements uh, are plus 1. Hydrogen can be plus or minus 1. It's a kind of an exception. 2A elements tend to be plus 2. 3A elements, well, the, the one that isn't, that doesn't include some of the later quantum levels is plus 3. Uh, 4 doesn't really form ions, so. Yeah, well, then well, that'll make more sense later. Yeah. 5A nonmetals will be minus 3. So think about eight, 5 minus 8. Negative Remember three. octet rule and valence electrons and being like a noble gas. 6A nonmetals negative 2. 7A nonmetals negative 1. You don't have to worry about noble gases because they don't make bonds with anything. So they don't form ions. No charges. And then with the, um, with the, with the transition metals and metals below quantum level 3, Notice that some of these metals can have more than one charge. Um, there's a more complete list in your book that you're going to have to be familiar with uh, because some metals can have different ions of different positive charge. Some of them have more than one charge. Uh, monatomic ions, symbols and names. So these are ions consisting of one element. Um, things that have one charge when we name them, it's just magnesium ion. The metals are called just the name of the element, um, but the cat, uh, sorry, the cations are just the name of the element. The anions wind up ending with IDE, so you'd see chloride at the bottom. Also, for, for cations, remember that the ones that can have more than one charge, we indicate the charge with a Roman numeral. So the reason why copper. This version of copper has a plus one charge. There are two versions of copper, plus one and plus two. The way we distinguish between them is we use Roman numerals. So this copper, because it's plus one, would have a Roman numeral one. Um, if it were referring to copper two plus, then we would have copper with a Roman numeral two in it. And you're going to find most of those uh, uh, ions that have more than one charge state in uh, the D block as transition metals, mostly. Yeah. Um, there are also um, other kinds of special ions known as polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are groups of elements that are connected together and carry a charge as a unit. So they're collectively working together and the overall charge will be what's shown here on the, on the table. Uh, it's just a package deal and they always work together. and They stay together during chemical reactions a lot of the time. Uh, a couple things to be aware of here. This this, this uh, polyatomic ion has a negative one charge as a unit. A lot of people at first misread this. So there's two H's, a P, and four O's, and that whole thing together has a negative one charge. Okay? Um, 
Same thing over here. We have 1H, a P, and four O's, and that whole thing together has a negative two charge. So that charge is for the collective package. So we will almost never break these um, polyatomic ions up. They'll always move around as a single unit. Uh, how do we do formulas for binary ionic compounds? Now remember, binary ionic compounds only consist of two different kinds of atoms. It doesn't mean that the numbers are going to be equal, but it just means that the kinds of elements are only going to be two different kinds. We can do this in a few steps. Uh, if we know the, the charges of our positive and negative ion, and you know we, uh, we know the valence, which is the charge here, if we drop the plus and minus and crisscross, uh, the charges into the into the lower uh, right for each one. Oops, uh, that gives us the formula. Uh, there are some instances where we may have to reduce, and this is kind of illustrated in the bottom examples. Right. So notice how when we crisscross calcium and, and oxide, you end up with twos, so that reduces to CaO. So we're always looking for lowest whole number ratios for. Um, ionic compounds. And we'll, we'll take the time to definitely practice this in class. Yeah, very much so. And then the same thing for lead. This happens to be lead 4, and, and this is oxide again, so we cross, so the lead goes to 1, lead 4 goes to 1, and the oxide goes to, goes two. to 2. Right. For ternary ionic compounds, there's, it's basically the same method, but there are a few extra steps for some special things that can come up. Um, first thing you'll do is you'll write the symbols for the metal and the polyatomic ion. Now remember the, um, um, the metal, you need to be very sure of the charge to make sure it's not one of those um, ones with Roman numerals. And then the polyatomic ion, again, you're going to need to know the charges for those. And that's going to be a, uh, pretty much a memorization thing. Yeah. And then you're going to write the valences. Um, as superscripts above for each, drop the signs, and then you do the crisscross method. Now, the thing to keep in mind where, when uh, handling a ternary ionic compound formula is for the uh, polyatomic ion, you're going to want to, uh, if it's more than one of them, you're going to want to put parentheses around them. So when, let's say you've got SO4, for instance, that whole package has a minus two charge, that whole thing, if you wind up having two of them, you're going to want to put the SO4 in parentheses and then write a subscript for two. So it designates that the whole package, that whole poly polyatomic ion, that you have two of them in the compound. And we still reduce when we're, when we're dealing with ternary ionic compounds, but we only uh, reduce with numbers that are outside the parentheses. We never uh, uh, reduce the actual polyatomic ion itself. Right. And so here we have a couple examples to illustrate this. So if we have calcium and nitrate, we have plus two for the valence for calcium and negative one for nitrate. You cross after you drop the signs and because the number you're crossing into the nitrate is greater than one, we have to, in it, we have to encase the NO3 in parentheses um, to, to show that we need two of these to cancel out the charge of the calcium. Now, if you don't put the parentheses, it looks like you need 32 O's, which would not work. Wouldn't make sense. You also cannot give me N2O6 because that's not really a polyatomic ion. Yeah, it's an entirely different compound. So this is the convention that you have to follow. For the second example, we got aluminum and hydroxide. And again, same idea. The, the number we're crossing into the polyatomic ion is greater than 1. So we have to put parentheses on the outside. Um, for barium and sulfate, you follow the same motif. And you do the crisscrossing of the numbers. But realize that you have 2 and 2 for your subscripts. And that's not the smallest whole number ratio. So you're going to want to uh, factor those out and, be, and, and form a one-to-one -one ratio for, for uh, the correct answer. Yeah, so notice that we're reducing numbers outside of the parentheses and not inside, okay? Um, for this one, we have sodium phosphate. In this case, we crisscross. The three goes to the sodium, the one goes to the phosphate. Because this is a one, we do not require parentheses, right. okay? Um, and then in the last one, same kind of idea, um, crisscross again. And even though it looks like this reduces, remember, there is no number. We only reduce outside of the parentheses. We don't reduce unless if there's no parentheses there. So memorizing what is a polyatomic ion and what isn't is going to be 
pretty important because you don't want to confuse yourself and think that it's actually four oxygens in a sulfur. It's the whole sulfate that is your polyatomic ion. That's probably a better way to think about it. Um, naming binary on a compound. So these are rules for just naming uh, L, uh, compounds that are made up of two different elements that are ionic, bonded to each other. Uh, we name the cation, and then we name the anion. Um, remember, uh, the metal comes first, and then it may or may not need Roman numerals if it's one of those metals that is polyvalent or has more than one charge. And then remember, the anion already ends in IDE, but if you've forgotten, remember add the IDE to it. So the metal comes first, non-metal comes second, and then you may or may not have parentheses and a Roman numeral if it's one of our special and, metals. And if you forget, if you forget which one you read or, or write down first, the periodic table works left to right, metals on the left, non-metals on the right. So you just go left to right. For ternary ionic compounds, um, same idea, cation first, anion second. Again, as with binary ionics, we name the metal. It may or may not need Roman numerals. And then we just name the polyatomic ion. We don't add any IDEs or, or changes like that. Right. So just keep the name as it is for the polyatomic. So for instance, if I gave you FeNO33, you would be able to figure out that it was iron 3 nitrate. Now let's figure out. Uh, let's, Why the 3? Yeah. So when you first see this, see this formula, you, you, if, you're, if you've memorized your, your metals, you'll know that iron can either be plus 2 or plus 3. So I know that the Roman numeral on this is either a, either a Roman numeral 2 or a Roman numeral 3. So how do I figure that out? Well, the anion helps us figure that out. And also the fact that the sum of the ions have to add up to 0 helps us. Now, this nitrate, hopefully you'll, you would have memorized that it has a negative 1 charge. And as shown with the 3 outside of the parentheses, there are three of them. So your total charge for the anions is actually negative three. So three times negative one is negative three. Now iron has to have the charge to cancel that out. So it has to be plus three in order for that to be true. It can't be iron two because of that. And that's how I know it's iron three. Okay. And naming acids. Now acids are a little different. They look, um, they're the only, they're ionic, but they're not. And we're gonna have a whole unit in the spring semester about acids. But as far as we're concerned, they behave like ionic compounds. Ionic, but kind of not. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of that's why it has its own naming system. The way we name the thing about acids to be aware of is that H plus is always the cation for acids. Okay? You never have metals or anything else. Right. It's H plus, a certain number of H pluses, and then and then any anion. The anion could be polyatomic or it could be monatomic. It doesn't make a difference. What we find here is the naming system for acids. It depends upon what the anion is. If it ends in IDE, if it ends in ATE, or if it ends in ITE. Okay. If it ends in IDE, we had hydro, ic, and then the root name of the of the anion in that blank spot there. So this is chloride, so this becomes hydrochloric acid. And you'll, and you'll get used to how it fits together and flows as you practice it more and more. And if it ends in ATE, it ends in IC only. So notice there's no hydro. Right. So for perchlorate, it would be perchloric acid. Or for chlorate, it would be chloric acid. Uh, if it ends in ITE, we add OUS. So we chop off the ITE and add OUS. So chloride becomes chlorous, and hypochlorite becomes hypochlorous acid. And again, notice how we add H's, just Different. like we do for binary ionic and ternary ionic compounds to balance out the charge. Right. So although these examples all have only one hydrogen, that's because the, uh, the anion that it's attached to only has a negative one charge. Chloride, perchlorate, chlorate, all of those all have negative one charge. If we had, uh, if we had a uh, anion that had a negative two charge, then you'd get uh, two hydrogens instead of just one for the formula. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's it. So until next time.